Let's go to the Word of God, and then we're going to talk about something that few people have. A head. A brain. I'll say this. Is my microphone on? If they'll yield it to God, they won't have a problem. Amen? Is it on? Is it on? He says it's on. Anyway, uh, where are we going to start? Ephesians. We'll turn there and get ready to just say, wow, amen, hallelujah. It's going to be fun stuff tonight. This is what I wanted to preach this morning. God wouldn't let me. So, Ephesians chapter 1, let's start there and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. I saw you fussing over Gwenny. Is she okay? Oh, well, I was going to tell her his grace should be sufficient, so get over it. But little children don't understand that sometimes, do they? Amen. Sometimes us adults don't get it either. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I uh, didn't know anything about the brain, and then I just started asking God about the brain, and... Uh, God had some wonderful things to, to share. And uh, I don't have this finished yet. It's not anywhere near done. I mean, I'm just getting started on this. But uh, just what little bit I'm going to show you tonight, um, you're going to be, number one, grateful that you have one, a brain. And uh, you're going to realize that it belongs to God, okay? Because it's got, like Him, all in it. All right? And I'll show that. <laughs> I'm just going, this is pretty cool. Because I had, I better pray before I get too happy. All right? Anyway, it's good to be here tonight. I appreciate y'all. Appreciate uh, the uh, pastor appreciation time. I really appreciate that. And uh, appreciate the pie and the cake and all the gifts and the thank yous and throwing cards at me. That was pretty good, Rose. Okay? So just watch out for repercussions, okay? It's like the guy said in, uh, what was it, Tombstone. It's not about vengeance. This is a reckoning, okay? So anyway, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for being so good to us. Thank you, God, for what you share with us. Thank you, Father, for the time that we live in. And Lord, I... Lord, I know this world is it's becoming and turning into very, very vile, very wicked. Lord, we are living in and amongst very, very wicked people. And Lord, it, it bothers us. Lord, we wanted to escape that. Father, we want your righteousness. We want your goodness in our lives. And Lord, we're like Lot. We just get vexed with living so close to Sodom. And Father, we just pray, dear God, that one day you'll deliver us from this. But Father, also, Lord, in the time that we live in, so many things are being discovered. So many things are being known. New things are being understood. And Lord, when I see these things, it never disproves your word. It's always right there. And I thank you for the days that we live in. Father, we know, Lord, what seed is. We know what the book is. We know, Father, how we're born again. We understand a little bit more than our forefathers did. Help us, dear God, with the stewardship of that knowledge, Lord, to be able to convey it to a very lost world, to be able to reach into the hearts and into the minds and lives of People, Lord, who have backslid or people who right now do not believe. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would take the things that we learn and, God, you would use them to bring even, un even atheists, Lord, will come to recognize that Jesus Christ truly is King of kings and Lord of lords and that the Bible really is the Word of God. And Father, we just pray, God, that you would just open up our eyes and our understanding tonight. Thank you, Lord, for this Bible. Without this Bible, God, I would be lost. 
Without this Bible, Lord, I would not have anything with which to share. Father, without this Bible, I would not really have the joy in my life that this Bible brings me just by learning things, Father, sitting at your table and learning them. Lord, we just ask God you bless us tonight, open up our eyes, and Lord, just I pray that you'd bless these people. Lord, they are very, very good to me today. And Lord, I'm asking God that you give them a double blessing. Lord, Father, for the blessing that they have been made to me today. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Ephesians 1, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Think, verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. You might underline that in your Bible. That is the opposite. We are the opposite of the Illuminati in this world. Amen? We're the ones who have the real enlightenment, the real knowledge, the real light from heaven. We have that, and it's the Word of God. That ye might, watch this, that you may know what is the hope of His calling. Now, the Bible talks about, and this is obvious answer, the Bible talks about all the different parts of our body, our feet, it talks about our legs, talks about our hands, arms, and everything like that. What part of the body? Let me ask this to Callie. Callie, did you, did you see the look she's giving me? I wonder what side of the family she learned that from. Oh, I hear you. Callie, verse 18. What part of the body is being spoken of in verse 18, where he says that you may know what is the hope of his calling. That you may know. When you know something, where do you know it? Your armpit, your fingernail? Oh, okay, I can't say she's wrong. All right, Jr. What part of the body do you know things in? Brain, thank you very much. That you may know what is the... By the way, you two guys are going to be the perfect example of what I'm going to show tonight. Both answers technically are the same. One is a lot more creative than the other. Right? Girls are a lot more creative than guys are. Right? which means they can decorate better. They have a better grasp of what colors go with, with what, right? And it means they can lie better, I guess. I don't know. Us guys, we can just, we don't tell good lies. Girls, boy, they come up with stuff, don't they? Just, just fool. Anyway, verse 19, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the mighty working of his power, of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality. Think about now how he's talking about God. He is far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Now, verse 22, watch this. Hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. So, should I ask J.R. or Callie? Verse 22. What part of the body is over the church? What do you say? Wayne's. I'll take that. It's the head. The head. Where did God put your head? On top. This is the body. There's, there's wisdom in this, people. Now, you listen to this. Here's the church. Here's Christ. Got it? That's it. That's the wisdom of it right there. Christ is not subject to the body. Okay? The head controls the body. Where's your breathing controlled? Okay? Your heart regulated. Here. Okay? Your balance, your walking, it's all done here, okay? Everything. When the body receives air, it gets it from the mouth, which is on the head. 
When the body goes someplace, it needs vision. It gets that from the head. When the body needs, faith comes by, that's also on the head. Okay? And so all these things. Who, what, what then speaks for the body? Head does. We are the body. We have needs. Those needs need to be brought to the attention of God the Father. Who then, who then speaks for the church? The head does. We cannot approach God on His throne without the head being the mouthpiece for the church. We're, we are sinful. God is sinless. And the head is the mouthpiece for the body speaking to God what the body needs. Does that make sense to everybody? There's so much, if you just start thinking about it, there's so much wisdom in this. Okay? So anyway, uh, the head over all things which is His body... The fullness of him that filleth all and in all. In Ephesians 4, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men. Uh, let's see here. I have, a, I have my one. Come up here, Liam. Michael, got to zoom in on this now. The hands are quicker than the eye. Come here, Liam. You want this quarter? Come on, buddy. All right, ready? Okay, you got to watch now, okay? We're going to put it in his hand. Now blow on it. And it disappeared. Oh, no, it's in your ear. Look at that. That fell right out of his head. You know what that was? The slight of men. Okay? I only know like three tricks. And that's one of them. Okay? Just to make kids think that the quarter's in this hand, but it's in this hand. It was in this, it never left this hand, okay? I've watched magicians. I like to figure out how they do stuff, okay? Watching the slight of men is no different. Cunning craftiness. Mo a lot of magic is nothing more than sleight of hand. It's about trickery, deception, getting you to watch this while something's going on over here. That's how the devil will work, okay? So verse 15. Speaking the truth in love that may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together, compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual work in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. These are verses now that talk about God is the, or Christ as the head. Colossians 1, 18. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. He's talking about Christ. That verse in uh, verse 19, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, he's speaking of the fullness of what is the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. We believe in the Trinity, do we not? That these three are one, all right? Now, the Bible word for that is not Trinity. That is not in your Bible. The Bible word for that is Godhead. Now, I've been told, Brother George, by people who are way smarter than me, that that is a poor translation. That a better translation of that is divine nature or Godhood or anything else other than Godhead. But I just, I just think that the Bible's smarter than the scholars. And those men put that word Godhead, Godhead. Think about it. We're talking about the brain. And it's not the Godhood. It's not the divine nature. It's not the Trinity. It is the Godhead. And I'm going to show you why. Do you think there's something with your head that has to do with God the Father, God the Son, or the Word, and God the Holy Spirit? I would say yes if I were you, knowing me. Okay? Uh, Colossians 2, 9, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So, here's the head. The head is made after the image of Jesus Christ. And in Christ is the fullness of the Godhead. We were talking about that this morning. We are talking about who Christ is. If he is not fully God... By the way, I got a text message from a family that they were here at homecoming. They follow us. They said, Pastor, while you were teaching that this morning, they said they had some Jehovah's Witness come to their door. 
knocking on their door. And the brother said, I'm going to whip out my can of King James here on these people. And they asked them, they said, uh, the family that watches us ask the Jehovah's Witness, do you believe in the Godhead, the, the Trinity? The, they said, no. And they said, right here, you know, John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word. And they said, don't give us that, don't give us that King James stuff. Well, they hate the King James Bible. You know why? Proves them wrong. Proves them wrong. You just read Bible verses to them. They'll, boy, they'll get mad. Boy, they will. They don't like it. They got a different spirit than we do. Okay? But anyway, in, and then finally he asked him, because he heard me talk about Reg Kelly facing those Mormon guys and asking them, do you believe that Jesus is Almighty God? And they said, no! Just like, boom. Okay? So anyway, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. There's something in your head is a representation of the Godhead. And ye are complete in him. Who in here needs another finger? Need another arm, Sterling? Sterling always wished he had an arm coming out of the middle of his chest because some things were just awkward for him to do. If you ever work with your hands, if you just had that third arm, okay? Yeah. But God said you're complete, so shut up. Anyway, you're complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. Psalm 1843. Thou hast delivered me from the strivings of the people. And thou hast made me, this is Christ, may have made me the head of the heathen. That's who we are. We're the people who were no people. A people whom I have not known shall serve me. He's not talking about Israel. He's talking about us heathen who follow and serve God. And God made Jesus the head over all of us heathens. Amen. By the way, everything that you learn in the Bible about Jesus makes you way smarter than every Jew on, in the world. Because they don't know it. And they won't know it. They won't receive it. They don't believe it. Romans 1.20. Well, I could spend my time dealing with the Godhead in Romans 1.20. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So, ask yourself the question. 20th century really would go down as the century of the, the basic advancement of medical science. What it took four to 5,000 years for mankind to learn prior to the 20th century, in the 20th century, man's knowledge of the human body and medical science advanced farther in just 100 years than man ever learned in all the previous, and it had to do with the invention of the microscope, had to do with a lot of things that were invented, uh, the invention of the x-ray, and so on, the ability to look inside the body without ripping it open, and so on, the ability to look at small things in the body, the ability to dissect things in the body and understand how they work understanding electrical impulses, understanding how DNA works and so on. We have, that, we have that knowledge now more than our ancestors do. And everything that I learn about the human body, and I'm not a doctor, but everything I learn, the simple things that I learn, I see God's handiwork in it. I usually take you right to the Bible and say, that's what the Bible says right here. Okay? And I just love that. But he's, his Godhead can be seen in the things that he's made, so they're without excuse. And then 1 John 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So, um, what I'm going to share with you tonight, I basically watched one five-minute video. And it's a real simple explanation of the parts of the brain. Very simple. I like to keep stuff simple. Stupid. Okay? Simple and sweet. All right? So, here's your brain. And here's the interesting part. Your brain, if you were to take both your hands and do like this. No, seriously. Take both your hands and do like this. Okay? However big your hands are, that's general. Sterling, play along. Put your hands together, Sterling. There you go. I know him. He had his wallet in his other hand. He ain't going to let go of it. I can tell you that. 
That's how big your brain is. However big your hands are, that's about how big your brain is. Okay? Now, don't be going, see, mine, be doing this. See, mine, mine's bigger than yours. Okay? Guess what? In the head, the brain, science has figured out that there are not four, not seven, not twelve, three primary parts to your brain. Three of them. You can quit doing this, Ron. Okay? The God head has three primary parts. First part, the cerebrum. That is the big mass of your brain. By the way, the, cere the cerebrum, cerebrum, the cerebrum is over the other two parts. It is the most high part of every working thing in your body. The cerebrum. So who does that represent? God, the most high God. Second part is the cerebellum. It handles things like motor functions. Not spark plugs and cylinders and pistons and stuff like that. Motor heads. Spatial recognition. Moving about in the world that we live in and the part of the brain that controls eye-hand coordination, uh, the part of the brain that causes the body to move, that's Jesus Christ. God always stayed the most high, did He not? Who is it that came down from His Father and walked among us and moved us about? It's Jesus. Okay? By the way, the cerebrum makes the decisions. Not the cerebellum, not the, uh, not the brainstem, the cerebrum. That most high part of your brain, that big, looks like big plate of noodles, that's what makes all your decisions in your, in your life for you, good or bad, that came from the most high part of your brain. God is the one who is always in charge. Amen? And then, the, the brain stem, watch this now, it is the one that connects both the cerebrum and the cerebellum to the body. It is the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit, watch this, when we pray, who in here knows what to pray? None of us do. When the body... Sends, when the body senses something or the body needs something, it sends that signal up through the spinal cord into the brain stem. The brain stem is what, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? It's part of my brain working with speech. It's not working very well. Huh? Communicates or translates that message into, a, into the centers of the brain that can fulfill the desires or the wants or the needs of the body. That is the Holy Spirit of God. And th if you don't have one of these, you'll die. Guys that want to kill themselves, they put a pistol in their head and they blow their brainstem out because it instantly stops breathing, heart function, things like that. You're dead instantly. Okay? Or let's say they decided to take out your cerebellum. Okay? You don't have that. The body cannot move. You'll die. Without the cerebrum, the most high, making the choices, making the decisions. All three of them have to be working in your brain in order for you to live. Say amen to that. Okay? I like this kind of stuff. Look, look at your Bible. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. You have one brain. Take good care of it. Okay? One good brain. But the three parts always work together. Romans 5, 15, 6. That ye with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. One mind. 
2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect and be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be, shall be with you. Philippians 2, 2. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be what? Like-minded. Having the same love. Being of one accord. Of one mind. 1 Peter 3, 8. Finally, be ye all of one mind. Having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. I promise you, your brain, your brain wants the rest of the body to be well, to be whole, to be without pain, to, be, to have its needs met, and for all the body to act as one together makes your brain work better. Does it not? When you are sick, you cannot think the way that you would normally think when you are well. Okay? When you are in pain, when you are sick, when something is broken on your body or whatever, if there's an issue, if there's a problem, if there's... My goodness, if you're hungry, who in here... They, what do they call it now? Hangry? I know some of you. Okay? Who's calling me? Oh, I wish I could take that phone call. I need to do that. I'll do that right after church. Okay? That is uh, Rhonda Stone calling me. Her mother passed away last, was it last night? Night before last? Anyway, y'all pray for her, okay? So anyway, finally, you be all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love his brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Your brain, your mind, wants the body to get along, to be whole, to be well, okay? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You're gonna lie. I don't know how much of this I'm going to get out, but man, I love this stuff. Hey, everybody look up there real quick. Hang on. Wait till you see what that is. How about, let me show you. Uh, oh, I am going to show you this before I, before, I, before I forget it and run out of time. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Turn there real quick. I do want to show you this. If I don't get done with anything else, I'm going to show you this. This was one of my woohoo things. If your Bible says something, it's right. Okay? 1 Peter, what did I say? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. What does that say? Somebody's there real quick, read that. First Peter 1, 13. Just out of curiosity, who in here believes that your mind has loins? That's what it says. It's called the limbic system. Okay? You write this down and you go Google this and study this thing out. I'm, I'm just on the very crust of knowing this. Okay? But I was, watch, I was looking at it and I'm going, look at there. There's like... There's actually two parts. To it. it look like loins. I'm not trying to be vulgar, but it looks like loins. Gird up the loins of your mind. The limbic system has to do with your drives, has to do with the effects that drugs and alcohol have on your brain. And drugs, especially drugs, will give... It's the limbic system that has to do with how the body feels pleasure. Like... The first time you hold the girl's hand and you get that, whoo, remember that? Remember that, George? Whoo, okay? That's the limbic system, okay? That's what releases dopamine, you dope, into your body and it gives you these, this pleasurable sensation, okay? I, mean, I love this, okay? Um... Eating chocolate, we'll do it. Getting a back rub, we'll do it. Um, certain medications, we'll do it. It'll give you a pleasure. This is why some people get hooked on, like opioids and stuff like that, they'll get hooked on them. Because the pleasure sensation is being released, and it's in the limbic system, it's the loins of your mind, and... 
I mean, it's a tough one. Once people get hooked on that, it's a tough thing to get off of because you're used to that pleasure. Okay? The loins of your mind. He said, gird up the loins of your mind and be what? Sober. There's the connection right there. Okay? Cut out all that stuff that you're thrusting into your body to release that pleasure and just get normal pleasure the way everybody else is supposed to. Okay? And I'm not mentioning other things either for various reasons that bring pleasure, that pleasure sensation. You can get hooked on those things. And the Bible says, gird up the loins of your mind, which I take, and be sober, which I take it to mean cut out all that stuff that you're, you're trying to get that pleasure every single day, all day long, and it'll kill you. God did not mean for that. Usually, it brings a type of drunkenness. So cut that stuff out. Okay? But I just, I'm just going, God, you are so cool. If he said, if God said, gird up the loins of your mind, that means God, 2,000 years ago, knew that our mind had a set of loins in it that needed to be girded and strengthened so that we're not weak-minded. Well, I love this Bible. I'm not even scratching the surface of this stuff. Okay? 1 Corinthians 2, 9, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him, but God has revealed them to us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Do you know how much God charged me to teach me this stuff? Not a thing. Okay? We're going to have... I'm not... I say I'm not boasting. Maybe I am a little bit. We're putting on a prophecy conference this week, and I've been to the big show prophecy conferences, and they charge quite a bit just to get in the door. And we don't do that. And never going to do that. Ain't right. They're freely given. That means I ought to freely give them. Amen? So, it, so maybe that is just a little bit of boast, okay? But anyway, uh, verse 13, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. For he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? In other words, who, which of us here thinks he's smart enough to tell God what his business is? You'd be surprised. The whole word faith cult believes that God doesn't know and cannot act outside of you saying what God needs to hear and then releasing God for him to do it. It's a bunch of baloney. Amen. I wouldn't say fried bologna because I like fried bologna. Amen. So anyway, he said, so who is, who's, who's on the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him? Here's that verse I wanted to get to, but we have the mind of who? Now think about that. He means exactly what you said. Pam, your brain is just like my brain. With the exception of my brain doesn't have as many roses and flowers in it as yours, Okay. You have the mind of Christ. 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 You have the, all y'all, all y'all have the mind of Christ. Amen. That means the brain that God put in us is matching everything that the Bible says about Christ who is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amen. Now watch this. One brain, two hemispheres. One brain two hemispheres, two halves of the brain. Come up here, Megan, teach that. Because she's, she's got it. Because I didn't even put that... She, you know what she's back there doing? It, she's reading the screen where it says left side controls right side, one strong, one weak, and she's going. That's a smart girl you got there. Amen. You know what it is? She's believing the Bible. 
You see two. You see something divide, rightly divided in half. One is strong, one is weak. Now the left side. This I don't know why this is, but the left side of my brain controls the right side of my body. The right hemisphere of my brain controls the left side of my body. Okay, but how it is with me, I'm right-handed. Okay, so this is the strength side of my brain. This is the weak side of my brain because my left hand cannot do what my right hand can do. Thus, in your Bible, the New Testament, on the right side, it is at the right hand. It is strong in that it can save us. The left side of the Bible is the Old Testament cannot save the Bible. The Old Testament's weak in that it pertains to the flesh. When God says, don't do this, our flesh is too weak to obey that commandment. We can't do it. I made that, I tried to preach that this morning. If you've got one blemish on your bald forehead, the whole body is unclean. It, after that, it doesn't matter how much of your body is consumed with leprosy. According to God, if it's one blemish, it's utterly unclean. Amen? But I was looking at that. I did not even touch the hem of the garment of that word utterly in the Bible or uttermost. But you study that out. I was going to study that out last night. I got too tired. You study the word utterly or uttermost or anything related to that. Just go through your Bible and let God show you some deep things in there. When God says utterly, he means... I, that they, the preachers talk about this old phrase that says, Safe from the guttermost to the uttermost. That means brought down from the depths up to the highest. Amen. That's how God saves us. Amen. But here's your brain. Now here's a... I love this stuff right here. Look at this. I may just touch on this and, and send you home because I still got packing to do and we got to leave early. All right. But here's your brain. The left side of your brain is where the strength is. It is where, in the, in the cerebrum, where the decisions are made, the left side of your brain is in charge of making choices that are logical. Um, if I were to ask you, just in a general, just everybody, whoever wants to answer this, in this room, are the lights on or off? They're on. That was this side of your brain that made that decision. Now, I'm going to ask everybody, what color are these lights? What color are they? There you go. What color are they? What color are these lights? What color are these lights? Alicia says marigold. I don't know who that is, but marigold somebody? Who in here thinks it's not yellow? It's some other different shade of yellow. Okay? That's the right side of your brain. The, right, the left side of your brain is only concerned with black or white. Right or wrong. True or false. Yes or no. Straight lines. Is this, is this an exact 90 degree angle? That's the left side of your brain. The right side of your brain says, who cares? Let's draw circles. Right? Okay? Now, think of it like this. Um, the, the right side of your brain is where music comes from. The right side of your brain is where art comes from, if you can draw. The right side of your brain is where intuition comes from, feelings come from. Um, it is where the imagination is. The left side of your brain decodes things. Everybody look at the page of your Bible. You can read the words because the left side of your brain has learned over the years that the letters, has learned to identify the letters, has learned to put the letters together in words, and has learned over the years to put those words together in a proper syntax and spell out the language that you and I all know. Now, we don't know Chinese, but if we were going to learn Chinese, we would have to learn it by way of the left side of our brain. We'd have to know every one of those Chinese characters, know what they're related with, and then know that when they're in a certain pattern or sequence, 
that that is a Chinese phrase or a Chinese word or a Chinese thought or whatever it is. And Chinese, very, Chinese has what, 200 some odd different characters in it? That's how big the alphabet is in Chinese? I'd hate to type Chinese. Okay? But anyway, uh, that's the left side of your brain. Now, um, somebody, Pam, John 3.16, go. But have everlasting life. That's all right. Okay? That was the left side of her brain that did that. Okay? Now watch this. Describe for me, Courtney, describe Goliath. However you want to. It's your picture. Draw it however you want to. Bug eye. There you go. Anything else? How does he smell? How does Goliath smell? Bad. That's the right side of your brain drawing a picture. So here, here's, watch this. You're reading your Bible. You're reading the Old Testament. You're reading 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17, the, right, the left side of your brain is decoding the symbols on the page. The handwriting. It's understanding the noun, the verb, the subject, the adjectives. It's understanding all of that. While you're reading it, the right side of your brain is drawing in your mind's eye a picture of, of the story that you're reading. If you've ever read a book, like a novel, and then they made a movie out of it, and you watch the movie and you're going, they got that all wrong. You know why? Everybody's brain has a different way of drawing the picture that the same words on the page, same words on the page, everybody's picture is different. Now, which is, according to God, which should be the preeminent part of your Bible reading? The words on the page or the picture you draw? Words on the page. Because the words on the page are what binds us all together. When she said John 3.16, it's the same John 3.16 that I know John 3.16 and the same one you all know is John 3.16. Amen? That's what, it's not our imagination that ties us together. It's the word. Amen? But see, the imagination is there to help the left side of your brain understand a little bit about what this is saying, about what God is trying to teach you there. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay? Because this, this gets really, really cool. Okay? Now, uh, parents. Pick on, this pick on Courtney night. Okay? Because Liam, he's a good boy. But he doesn't always say it right, does he, Mom? Okay? So, can you tell when Liam is not being truthful? Are you learning it still? Okay. But he can do it, right? Okay. Hope? Can you read her a little bit, Mom and Dad? Okay. You know why? Your conscience is here. The left side of your brain has stored facts and data about events in your life, especially things you did right or wrong. When mom and dad say, tell me what happened today and don't lie to me. If you don't want to get in trouble, Megan... What you have to do is, this side of your brain has to draw a picture that is different than what this side of the brain knows happened. Right? This is your, the Bible even says that your conscience witnesses against you. God draws it in the face of man that when he lies, his conscience bears witness against him. Now, I've, I learned this a little bit. I watch Judge. I don't watch her so much anymore. I used to watch Judge Judy a lot, and she was good at picking these people out because she would ask them a question that was way off their script. 
And it required them to either tell the truth and convict themselves or cause them to lie. And when they lied, she caught them every time. Because to lie, before you speak, your brain has to work quick and draw a picture of what you want to present to the judge. Invariably, your eyes will betray you. They will look down to the left, usually. When the judge asks somebody, what day was this? When they try to remember what day, and they're going to tell the truth, almost without fail, the eyes will look up and to the right. Because we're going, it's like we're flipping through papers going, uh, yeah, right here, judge, here it is. Happened on June 16th. Okay, thank you. And that's how, that's how our eyes do it. Now, some people train their eyes and they can get away with it. But normally, you, the eye is the light of the body. You want to know what's going on in somebody? We are designed by God to look into people's eyes, aren't we? Then what do we tell people? Then look me in the eye and tell me that. It's, and we, not, we haven't been trained in psychology. We haven't been trained in mentalist tricks or anything like that. It's just there's something in us that knows. You look in my eye and tell me that. And then I'll know whether or not you're telling the truth or not. That's, it's your conscience witnessing against you. If you have to tell the truth, all you have to do is rely upon memory. Who in here has ever been in a um, deposition? A guy sideswiped me. I was in a funeral procession. I had the right of way as far as the funeral procession was, goes, but he had the green light in the intersection. So he didn't see the funeral procession. He saw the green light, and he hit me. Turned out they just blamed both of us. But we had depositions over it. And I noticed their lawyer, that guy's lawyer, he would ask me a set of questions. And about 15 minutes into it, he'd say, now, just to help my understanding, I want to back up and I want to ask you, you said, you know, he, he'll ask me the same question again. What he's wanting to see is if I give him two different answers. If I lie, it's not as easy to remember the, the picture that I drew. It's easier for me to remember the facts that I told. And I didn't even realize it, but I would say, well, and I was getting annoyed with him, and I would say, well, as I told you earlier, and I was like, if you weren't listening, listen to the recording then. As I told you earlier, and what I did was I, and my lawyer, when I got done, he said, you did great. He said, he was trying to pick you apart, and ain't nothing to pick apart. He said, unfortunately, the other guy did too. So we settled, Okay. I'm just saying, that's, that's how it works, okay? Now, think about this. In fact, look up here on the screen very quickly. The right side. Think of the right side, or the left side as the male. Think of the left side as the female. Who decorates the house? But who builds the house? Think about it. I mean, I'm not trying to be sexist or anything like that. This is just how we are, okay? Now, watch this. I'm going to give you a story out of the Bible. God saw the man and said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Meet means he'll meet his needs. He's sufficient for him. Now think about what I just said when you're reading your Bible. Your left side of your brain is decoding the symbols on the page. But the right side of your brain is necessary to help you with the understanding of it. Amen? Husband, Brother George, that woman sitting next to you, is that your wife? Is that your real wife? Okay. Has she ever helped you make a decision? Has she ever helped you from being a fool of yourself? Okay. Is she the boss? No. She can't be can't be. Okay? God designed the woman to be the weaker vessel. But watch this. Every king in the Bible had a counselor. King Ahasuerus, when he listened to Haman, the city was perplexed. Haman was an evil counselor. Who was it that brought joy back to the city when he finally started listening? 
Who, who eventually came in to counsel King Ahasuerus? Esther, the woman. She counseled him and said, King, let me tell you what's really going on. And he received, because he, and that, that was his wife, by the way. He received her counsel and God restored the city. Think about how your brain works. Think about how a marriage works. Think about how the body of Christ works. The head is not good being alone. I will make and help meet for him. Does not the head make its decisions based upon the needs of the body? When we pray, we pray through Jesus Christ, goes through the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ, the mediator, to the brain, to the top part of the brain, and the head becomes then the fulfiller of the needs of the body. That's good, isn't it? Boy, that is good. Now, let me, let me give you a dominant. Left side is dominant. It's logic, black and white, yes and no, fact, just the facts, ma'am. Right? Okay? Uh, when you're testifying in a court, does the court want your opinion? It wants facts. That's this. It's decisive. It is the source of truth. The right side is female. It is subservient. It is intuition. Because my wife will say, watch out for those people. Okay? Or watch out for whoever. Or stay away from that. She told me that about Stan Johnson years ago. She said, I don't like the guy. Honey, what's wrong? Come on, knock that stuff off. She was right. She couldn't tell me why she was right. But she was helping me. Uh, colors. Instead of yes, no, it's maybe. Imagination is here. Things being, instead of being decisive, they're open-ended. The right side of the brain will be the source of lies. Genesis 3. Turn in your Bible there. Genesis 3. Who did the devil approach? Eve. You should not eat of every tree of the garden. Verse 2, the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you should not eat of it. Neither shall ye. Where did that come from? She drew that in her mind. God never said that. Okay? So then back to that. For God does know, so the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now watch this. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, what part of her brain determined that that fruit would be good for food? The logic or the creative? Creative. Because it imagined how that food would be good for the body. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. What part of the brain? Right side. It fantasized about how that fruit would taste. And then, desired to make one wise. Desire is the weak side. And those three things made her decision. And they were contrary to the static, unchangeable word of God. God, God said his word, and who did he say it to? So what did Eve end up doing? She ate the fruit, and then what happened? Adam did as well, because he listened to the counsel of his wife. Okay? So you flip it upside down. Now here's Christ. Now Christ is adorned and blessed because his wife is blessed. Christ denied himself, didn't fall for the... Uh, just think about the opposite. In the Old Testament, the devil went for Eve. In the New Testament, he went for Christ, not the church. Christ won. Okay? Christ won. And how did he win? He's reciting unchangeable Old Testament verses. Boy, this stuff is deep. <clears throat> You take this and run with this very quickly. Megan, you, you spelled it out. <clears throat> the left side of your body, 
The left side of your brain is the New Testament. It is Christ revealed. It is the truth. It is revelation. It is doctrine. The left side or the right side of your brain is the Old Testament. Christ is not seen as Christ. He's in a type. He's in a shadow. He's in a mystery. He's in dreams. But he's not seen in his full revealed self until the New Testament, which is the left side of the brain. Isn't that beautiful? Woo! Next time we talk, we'll talk about the... Because something has to bind the two halves of the brain together. <laughs> and I'm not kidding you, there's four of them. Okay? Stand up. God's good, amen? What did I not get to? Oh, I didn't get to that part. The gates and the foundation. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. Amen. Who wants to lead us in prayer? Go ahead, John.